This program is brought to you by SoundsTrue.com. At SoundsTrue.com, you can find hundreds of downloadable audio learning programs, plus books, music, videos, and online courses and events. At SoundsTrue.com, we think of ourselves as a trusted partner on the spiritual journey, offering diverse, in-depth, and life-changing wisdom. SoundsTrue.com. Many voices, one journey. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. This episode is sponsored by Spirituality and Health magazine, bringing mindful coverage to topics that include faith, philosophy, meditation, and wellness. You can visit spiritualityhealth.com to learn more. Today, my guest is Adyashanti. Adyashanti is a spiritual teacher trained in the Zen tradition who lives in Northern California. Adya as he is called by friends and students, is often described as a non-dual teacher, someone who teaches about what he calls awakening to non-division. With Sounds True, Adya has published a new book and audio program entitled Resurrecting Jesus, Embodying the Spirit of a Revolutionary Mystic, in which Adya explores the deep, mythic underpinnings of the Gospels, to show how we can find the story of Jesus a source of inspiration for our own spiritual unfolding. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, Adya and I spoke about his experience of Jesus' story as a map of awakening. We also talked about Jesus as a revolutionary figure and the nature of suffering. We also talked about Adya's own experience with excruciating physical pain and how that experience relates to the metaphor of the crucifixion. And finally, we talked about the redemptive quality of love and how love can restore us to our natural state of worth. Here's my conversation with Adyashanti. Adya, what's a Zen guy like you writing, teaching, talking about Jesus? What are you doing with this Jesus phase of your teaching? Well, that's a really good question. I, um, uh, the, the Jesus story, as I like to call it, is always, from the time I was a child, been a really intriguing story to me. As far, as far back in my life as I can remember, I was always captured by this this character, you know, this really sort of charismatic and spiritual presence. I think that's what Jesus represented for me long before I really understood, really, even the story. It was more of a feeling, you know, a sense, a kind of transmission. And, you know, at different uh, points in my life, the story, sometimes it's been really de-emphasized. You know, when I first got into Zen Buddhism, I, I wasn't really paying attention to it very much. And then um, after five or six years of intense practice in Zen Buddhism, I I just intuitively felt, you know, something was missing. I didn't know what it was. And it was, and you know how you start to just sort of intuitively start to reach out. You grope around in your life for the things that, that you feel are missing. And when I started to connect with the Christian mystics again, um, they, through the Christian mystics, I kind of found what I was missing, which was really uh, an awakening of the heart, you know, a re- a really a coming alive of the vitality of the heart. And, um, and so once again, the story became, um, uh, really at that point, it was the Christian mystics more than the story that became, that re-enlivened the whole Christian, you know, uh, uh, message for me. Um, and then in the last, probably, you know, now those stories have informed my teaching. You know, I, I rarely go two or three talks without invoking some story or some mention of Jesus, you know, like I will do the Buddha and any number of different spiritual figures in history. And um, But over the years, I actually, in the last probably five to ten years, I actually got more interested in really the, studying the actual story 
you know, that I read in the Gospels and actually really studying the story instead of, say, to the mystics and all the interpretations of the story and the theology built around the story, but the actual story. And um, I really began to appreciate its sort of mythic quality in the sense that, um, that I think stories, these sort of mythic stories that can be a combination, often are a combination of some fact, historical, factual truth that did happen and things that didn't happen but are actually um, made up, um, but as a means to convey something. I, so I think these kind of mythic stories um, that get handed down to us through history and through our generations, um, that they, that they're, actu- they're, they're maps for the inner psychic and spiritual terrain of human consciousness. And that's what I started to see in the story. This story kind of maps itself to... It is the story of, of a certain inner domain of, of our consciousness. And that began to um, intrigue me, you know, in the same way that I see the Buddha story, which the Buddha story is also full of mythic elements. And it also maps the ter- to the terrain. And I really have gained, especially over the last five years or so, a real appreciation for these stories and these myths that that are sort of maps to our inner our inner psychic terrain and they speak to us both consciously and I think they also evoke emotions and experiences and moments of insight from a very deeply unconscious place within us. Do you know that that kind of comes from our heritage and living in these stories through our lives. In your book, Resurrecting Jesus, you talk about the story of Jesus as a map of awakening. And you do so in a way that I think is quite original. And I can imagine someone reading your interpretation of the Jesus story in this map of awakening, saying, well, you know, Adya took his own experience and mapped it onto the Jesus story. I'm not even sure I see the Jesus story that way, or someone could say something like that. What do you think about that? You've created your own sort of creative mapping here. Sure. I have. I have. And I think that's part of what looking at a story in a mythic way um, invites us into. I think it invites us into a creative relationship with the story. And so in that sense, I don't think that when we look at a story in a mythic way, that therefore we just project the entirety of our experience onto the story and only understand it from our own experience. I think it's a combination of trying to see what the actual story itself is evoking within us, number one. What does it evoke within us? What does it reveal to us about ourselves and the world and life? And also, then when we enter into sort of a creative relationship with it, that it's, I think it's entirely appropriate that we can then start to see our own experience reflected in the story. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person who created the story created it with, say, the map of awakening diligently in mind. I think most myths, I think of lot and stories, what's, what's in them is a combination of intentional uh, acts of creation, that, that they're, they're in, intentionally bringing certain thing, things through in the storytelling. And I think a lot of what's in a good story or a good myth is also the, the author's unconscious. What's, again, the inner psychic terrain of human consciousness is, 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 is finding its way into the story. So I would be the first to admit that by sort of putting a map of awakening onto this story, which the story is also a map of human consciousness, that um, that in a certain sense I'm imposing that. But I also, at the same time, I find within the story the, the sort of mythic images that very much actually speak to very concrete human experiences and revelations. So I think it's a real combination that I do think that the images within these sto- within this story very much um, is a, are metaphors that are speaking directly to um, experiences 
very deep spiritual experiences and insights. Um, and so I'm utilizing, I'm looking at the story in, in both with both um, kind of lenses, what's inherently within the story that it's trying to communicate to me, and how is the story creatively coming alive into me in my experience. And, of course, I'm adding my experience into it in a way that may be relevant um, for other people to engage with. It's part of the themes I try to bring out right at the beginning of this book is that I actually encourage people. I tell them there isn't a, a one and correct way to look at these stories and these myths. There isn't one correct interpretation. The beauty is, is when you enter into a very intimate and profound relationship with a story and stop relating with what people, have, everybody's told you about it, you know, of, of the for hundreds of years, but you start to enter into it yourself and you can start to, I think it's very legitimate and important to start to see how does this story speak to me and how does it highlight my own story, my own, my own journey through life. You know, so I really encourage people to, to have their own creative relationship at the same time as I'm writing about mine. You know, Ajay, I feel very comfortable with you taking a very creative approach to the Jesus story, and, and I want to go into this map of awakening that you find embedded in Jesus' life story. But what I'm noticing as I'm listening to you is it seems that a lot of people feel quite proprietary about the story of Jesus being interpreted in a certain way. And a Zen-trained person taking their own interpretive liberties might be offensive. And I wonder what you have to say about that. Well, I think it's, 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 I could understand that, number one. I could certainly understand that because, you know, we, we all tend to, um, there's a tendency to get sort of rigid in the way that we, in the interpretations that we make. And especially if we, these kind of, a story, it could be the Jesus story, the Buddhist story, the, you know, the story of, of uh, Muhammad, whatever, that when we, invest ourselves in those stories over a long period of time and we invest ourselves in a particular interpretation of them that to begin to open open up that lens that interpretive lens can be very challenging you know and and it can it can it we do sort of start to feel proprietary as if you know the way that I'm interpreting this or the way that my spiritual tradition has been interpreting this, that this is the one and only and true and right way. Um, I think one of the things in our modern culture that we have forgotten by, to a large extent um, is that uh, these, these sort of ancient stories and these ancient myths don't belong to one interpretation. They never did, and they never were necessarily um, intended to. So when we lock ourselves into sort of proprietary way of understanding something, um, it, it can actually inhibit our own spiritual growth because we're saying that I will not see something differently. I will not entertain a different view than the one that I'm comfortable with. And that's understandable because something within the human character that does not like to be put into, knock a little bit off balance. And, you know, it, at, at one point, at one sense, we resist that because it can make us feel a little less secure in our interpretations than we thought. But I think there's also something within the human consciousness, within the human heart and mind that also leans into that, which which actually likes new vistas of discovery and likes actually stretching, stretching itself, do you know? Um, and so, and I think that is exactly and precisely, and I think this isn't necessarily my impersonal interpretation. This is very much in the gospel story that this is precisely and exactly what Jesus was doing. He was a, he was stretching and in his own way, redefining uh, the, the religious stories of his own upbringing and the religious points of view of his own upbringing, and it and it unsettled people. 
and it made some people very unhappy, very angry. It was ultimately one of the reasons for his death. Um, and so, uh, but I think this is what we forget because when we when these stories become familiar to us and we get invested in seeing them in a particular way, we lose the revolutionary quality of the founder of this whole story, which was an extraordinarily revolutionary person, a very challenging person, and a person who could be very harsh in his criticisms of people who held on to rigid, small views of things. And so that happened 2,000 years ago, um, and it happens today. And none of us are immune to the resistance of feeling like we're being stretched, you know, to open to something beyond what's familiar to us. Um, at the same time that something in us, I think, um, yearns for those new vistas, the yearns for opening our minds and opening our hearts in, in new ways we might not have expected or thought of ourselves. There's a great quote from the book, Jesus as a revolutionary comes not so much to comfort us as to confront us. And it seems like this revolutionary nature of Jesus, the way that you read the story, is really important to you. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that, why that's such an important inspiration to you, this revolutionary quality. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if we're all honest, and I will approach it from a state of real personal honesty. I think for any of us, as we're honest of how we look at anything, that no matter how objective we, we might try to be, we're always looking at things through the lens of our own experience. We can't really avoid doing that. Um, and so this, is, this isn't the only Jesus that we find in the Gospels. Jesus is not only a revolutionary. You know, he's a comforter and he's a healer. And he's, there's all sorts, there's any number of uh, different qualities that he had in his life and that you find in the Gospels. But this one resonates, you know, uh, with me because I think it was at a certain point in my own spiritual life, I found that this was extremely important to, that I found that really the basis of a real authentic spirituality um, actually is born out of profound questioning. Um, if spirituality is something that's authentic, which is different necessarily from religion, religion serves a lot of cultural values of cohesion and mo modulating behavior, spirituality is sort of the radiance that can function within religion. It's the blossoming of human consciousness that can function in there. So from the standpoint of spirit, I think spirit, it's, in order to come into deeper and intimate contact with it, it always involves uh, a challenge to our preconceived ideas. That's not something I made up. That's something that's been in every single esoteric mystical tradition. Um, that the, 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 the normal ways of understanding life and oneself and these mythic stories, it's always challenged. We're always being stretched. And so because that became a real part of my own path, I saw that, um, that I couldn't just follow a teaching, even the one that I was partaking of in Zen Buddhism. I couldn't just follow some teaching simply because the Buddha said it and because it was old and ancient and revered that I actually needed to do exactly what the Buddha counseled, which was to prove everything true or false for yourself. Don't take it on my word, he basically said, to prove it all true or false for yourself. So that in, entails a kind of deep questioning. And when I found the courage in my life to begin to not just try to follow a teaching and do it correctly, but engage with it in which I could utilize it as a means to really question deeply into my own life and look at my, what are my 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 the beliefs and the the preconceived ideas that I'm holding that I may not even be aware that I'm holding. Um, uh, what are those, and why am I holding them, and are they really true? So all of that um, informed uh, my the way that I 
the approach that I took in this book to Jesus, which was to see him as a revolutionary character, because I think that's the part of Jesus that's probably the most potent when it comes to what I'm interested in as a spiritual teacher, which is real spiritual awakening. You know, we have to be challenged in order to awaken. You know, we have to have our preconceived ideas rattle. We have to look at them, re-examine them very deeply. One of the areas of questioning for me, and questioning in relationship to your work, Adya, has to do with suffering. And Sounds True published a book with you a couple of years ago called Falling into Grace, Insights on the End of Suffering. And now here we have the Jesus story. And we have a figure who it certainly looks like to me suffered, suffered Mm -hmm. through the crucifixion, Mm -hmm. suffered in different ways. I wouldn't say did suffering end in Jesus's life? Was he enlightened in that sense that there was an end of suffering? So I'm I'm curious how you make sense of this. Oh, that's a great question. In fact, it's one of the things that I appreciate the most about the story is that all the human elements were not uh, washed out of Jesus' character. And that's very rare in the history of spiritual literature. Usually all the sort of human, hu- human parts are washed out of the God-man or the God-woman or the sage or the saint or whatever. We never hear about them. Of course, they're almost, they're almost always dead so that we can make out of them anything we want. But in the Jesus story those human elements remained as a very intimate and profound part of the story. And I think it really goes to two things. I think that in the East, a lot of what we get in the East is um, a, a spirituality that's very focused on transcendence, that the way to deal with the sorrows of life is basically to transcend life, to go beyond it and as a way to to find a state of consciousness which is untouched by uh, the transience uh, of life. That's one way, and that's that's very typical in the religions we have from from India and from from Asia, and and this not exclusively, of course, but that's in general what we get. In the story of Jesus, we get a very, very different attitude, which this attitude isn't necessarily a... Uh, the, he, he is, he, his story is not saying that the way to deal with the transience and the difficulties of life is to simply transcend it and, you know, be here but barely, barely be here, be in some sort of transcendent haze your whole life. But actually it is to enter com- for spirit, which is the truth of our being, to enter completely, fully, in or a certain sense, to sacrifice the heavenly state of never being touched by anything and give itself to life entirely and completely. Now, you can't do that without having periods of pain, sorrow, sickness, old age, and death. You're going to experience, you're not just going to watch those from a deeply transcendent state, you're going to actually act actually deeply experience them. And the issue that you brought up, you know, of did Jesus suffer? Well, anybody that reads the gospel would have to answer, yes, he, he very, very obviously did suffer. There was moments where he was begging to get out of his destiny. Um, being nailed to a cross is never, uh, to say it's not a pleasant thing is, is an understatement. It's a, it's a gruesome, awful, terrible, painful way to die. Um, and to put on top of all that, not just physical suffering, but a kind of existential suffering. You know, when you're, when someone's pushed to that extreme, uh, that they, that Jesus did what a lot of people do, which is they, they go, why, God must have forsaken me. I feel abandoned. I feel uh, left alone by the God that I've based my whole life on. And there at the last moments of life, you know, he's screaming out, you know, why have you, why have you abandoned me? That's, so I think there's part of, there's actually a, literally a quality of awakening 
which is an embrace of the world, which I think the Jesus story really embodies, the embrace of the world, and part of embracing of the world is embracing that to, to completely embody yourself here, to completely embrace the world, is to consent, to say yes, to give your consent to the, the ups and downs of life. Now, the kind of suffering that I, when I say, you know, that we can, we can move beyond suffering, the kind of suffering that I'm talking about is sort of the, the kind of suffering that, that is probably 98% of people suffering uh, somewhere in that vicinity, which is a suffering of uh, an ego that sees itself as separate and is basically battling itself and battling against life and battling against what it experiences, especially when things aren't pleasant, that creates a great amount of psychic emotional turmoil. That, that isn't something... Jesus didn't walk around being in just emotional turmoil because people didn't like him or they didn't... You know, when someone didn't like him, he didn't cower into a state of, nobody likes me, I guess I'm not worthy. And You know, that kind of suffering that we can wake up from, we can... We can see through. We don't have to live that for the rest of our lives. Having said that, that if we're really going to be totally here, that um, there is a way that we, we are opening ourselves to, to exist, is to, is to um, experience pain. And I think that's embodied in the Jesus story, and I think it's part of a, it's a very, in that sense, it's a very honest, truthful story. It's very honest. It, it says, okay, great, you can be the son of God, you can dwell in the kingdom of heaven, and, and yet, don't, don't think that gets you out of any unpleasant experience that might come down the pike. That, that isn't how it's working. That's a misreading of what enlightenment's all about. And I, so I think that, it, that that's a very important message to to anybody, but especially to spiritual seekers. Very important message. In your own life, Adria, was there a time when you felt more comfortable with a transcendent approach and that that shifted at a certain point, or not really? Um, yeah, I, I mean, in general, yeah, that was, that was I mean, I, there, there, in general, there were times when I you know, really experienced that trans, totally transcendental state of consciousness. You know, I am consciousness, I am presence, I am awareness, and oh, look, it's so lovely not to be, to actually experience that it's not affected by what happens in time and that it was never hurt and harmed. And, you know, all that, the beauty of that, yeah, that was... Um, when that opened up for me, you know, um, I think like a lot of people, I kind of really lived in that to a great extent for a period of time. Um, given my, I think, just my character uh, as a as an incarnate human being, um, I don't think I was ever destined to, you know, be one of the people that wanted to hold on to that forever. I That never... That was never one of part of my agenda um, from the very beginning, from the first day I got involved in serious spirituality. I wanted to know enlightenment. That's one thing. But I also wanted an equally strong drive was I wanted my... I was very... Uh, it was very important to me what my contribution to the world was going to be. And so if you're at all interested in what your contribution to be going to be, what, what your existence here is going to, um, how it's going to affect the life around you and the people and the situations. If that's part of your concern, like it was for me, part of what you value, um, that, you know, that itself uh, doesn't lend itself to just a totally transcendent experience. Um, so for a while, I was very taken with a transcendent experience when it first occurred, but it wasn't very long before um, I felt that there was something there was something else. I, I knew very relatively soon, even though it felt like complete and free, and you know all those sort of descriptive ways that it gets talked about. But intuitively, I knew 
this isn't the the whole of it. This isn't the whole of the truth. This isn't the whole of who who I am. This isn't this isn't the complete view. I I don't even know how I knew it. I just knew that there was more to the story and and there certainly was. You know? There certainly was. And that a lot of the completing that was a lot of I think it's why I appreciate this story so much is because it speaks to that side of the journey. It speaks to that part of the journey with which is what it is to come to grips with with life as it is, with with people not understanding with all the beautiful parts, but that's easy for people. Um but people not understanding you, people not agreeing with you, people not liking you, um, feeling, you know, isolated, feeling apart from, feeling you know, all these things that you find in the Jesus story, as well as being inspired and, you know, wonderful revelatory experiences. Um, but uh, these were, you know, to, 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 to have it put into an actual story rather than a teaching, you know, that says, this is how you work with feeling this way. To see it in a story and to to see how someone moved in their life and to see that they didn't move completely untouched. They moved moved untouched by a lot of what bothers people, by most of what bothers people, but they were not completely untouched. That there 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 is there is um you know in, to be incarnated is to uh, and to be incarnated in a way that's very free and liberating is is it, it takes our consent to some of the realities to being incarnate to being here you know Aja, I'd love to get a little more clear on something that you said about suffering because I'm, I'm very interested in this. You said how 98%, and I, I realize that this is not uh, a math class, but it's whatever, the yeah. majority, huge majority of our suffering comes from this ego identification. And only and not only from that, but that's, that's kind of okay. a catch-all phrase. But that, yeah, that's a big part of it. What I'm trying to get at is in our own experience, how might we be able to sort out which experiences of suffering are just inherent in being a human being and having Mm -hmm. soft and tender hearts? How would you frame that? And what part is what we might call unnecessary suffering? Okay. Um, So let me start out by saying that I can give some sort of generalities, but, you know, we have to kind of feel it within, within, people have to feel what I'm saying within themselves. If they take the concepts too literal, they, it won't, they're, you'll find obs- exceptions to it. But as a generality, one way to begin to hone in on what is sort of um, a kind of, of, uh, of uh, the, just the, the normal sort of challenges or even difficulties of, of being, of living, of being here, as opposed to the ones that aren't actually really fundamentally necessary, but they comprise the vast majority of what people experience, is what part is of my emotional, psychological life and my experience, what part of my experience is being derived from um, fear? What part is being derived from uh, resistance? to say no to something, something within yourself, say no to yourself, I'm not worthy, I don't like myself, say no to somebody else, um, say no to life, you know, life is pretty uh, pretty strange right now, there's a lot of intense things going on in life right now, say no to life, um, all these ways that we go into opposition with what is, um, creates a kind of emotional imbalance, emotional, and that imbalance is experienced, one of the ways it's experienced is suffering. It hurts. You know, when we resist what is, it hurts. Uh, that's a way, a way that life's telling us you're not in harmony with life. You're suffering because you're resisting life, because you're judging life, because you're condemning life, because you're, or you're doing all that to yourself. That puts you at odds with, with, what life actually is, and um, and the result of that is suffering. So that's 
it's not a foolproof way, but I think it's as a generality, it's actually a really useful tool is to see, yeah, what part of my what elements of my suffering are caused from my own judgments and beliefs and opinions and, and just plain old resisting what is. That's the stuff that's actually, for the most part, that's unnecessary. That is not inherent within existence. It's, 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 it's not like if you are born, you have to suffer all that, that you don't have to suffer all that. It's optional suffering, I guess you could say. Could you give me an example from your own experience of non-optional suffering? Non-optional suffering. Okay, let's see. Well, I can go back to... Uh, I mean, the, the easiest ones to get a sense of are the most intense ones. You know, I went through That's a good. period... Some, That's good. What's that? That's good. That's fine. Yeah, some yeah. years ago where I had this extri- and totally undiagnosable, nobody could figure it out, Western medicine, traditional, anybody. Um, I eventually figured it out myself, but it took years. But I would go through these bouts of what I'd have this intestinal pain that would um, be completely overwhelming. And I'm really good at dealing with pain. I'm, it's, <laughs> for better or worse, I'm, it's, it's, it's one of the things I'm hooked up to be pretty good at, you know, and also being an endurance athlete for so many years, you get really good at managing pain. So I'm really pretty good at managing pain. This was the kind of pain that would put my body into shock, and I would be in an emergency room at a hospital in a fetal position on the, on the waiting room floor for hours, just shaking and just completely... You know, and this was, it was not only pain, but there was also an element of, I mean, it was, you can't have that degree of pain without it all having, having a kind of suffering to it. Um, and so there was a, there was a kind of profound, you know, pain and suffering at that moment. It was completely and absolutely um, unmanageable with any thing I'd ever realized, with any technique I'd ever had, uh, I realized if things get bad enough, everything breaks down. Everything breaks down. You, you can't manage certain experiences if they get too big. And um, it was very humbling to really realize that, to experience that was, you know, humbling. Um, it was, um, it, strangely enough, um, after going through that on and off for years, um, when I finally kind of found out how to cure it, um, strangely enough, I didn't come out of it with any fear. I didn't fear it happening again. I, um, when I would look at it, or if I would remember it, what, what, I would, what would come to mind immediately, and when this has literally never left me to this day, um, which was kind of, if I could put it into words, it would be like, Aja, now you've experienced life can and will and does turn on a dime. It, that's the name. It can turn in, immediately and unexpectedly. And you can find yourself in a situation that seems completely unmanageable and um, you're just reduced to, you know, your body going into total shock and there's nothing you can do about it. That's part of life. That's a reality of life. Um, however it comes about, those kind of things happen. And at some point, the unexpected will happen. You'll end up, you'll die. You'll get a disease that's incurable. Something will happen. You'll, you'll, we all have to say goodbye to the people we love most in our life. That's, those kind of things are not avoidable. What I came out of it with was, since now I know, I knew before, but it was a little abstract. Now I know in a way that's not abstract at all that, as the Buddha said, life is, everything in life is impermanent. This moment can and will change. Um, and it can change into something beautiful and it can change into something overwhelming. And what it gave me is a profound uh, appreciation, a profound sense of gratitude, of well-being for... Um, even the most ordinary, unimpressive moment of life. And that's never left me. 
that's never that's never left me. But that experience, those experiences were quite um, overwhelming, quite overwhelming. You know, I was glad that I had the background that I had, and I had realized what I had because I think that's the reason that I came out of it without fearing it. I'm not afraid of it. I don't anticipate it. I'm not. You know, I came out of it with a sense of being really grateful for every moment um, of life. And the other thing is it gave me a much deeper sense of compassion. I mean, I always felt like I had some real compassion for people suffering and, and whatnot. But having gone through that, I, I really, it definitely deepened my sense of compassion. You know, because I now I've experienced things. And I understand the overwhelm. I understand when somebody goes through something that they none of the what I call the tricks of the trade, the spiritual tricks, the psychological tricks. None of the tricks that all the tricks can break down if things get bad enough. And you just have to be with what's happening. You have no choice. And it's created me a great, a much deeper sense of compassion for what people go through. You're listening to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. We welcome you to learn more about our collection of more than a thousand learning programs and receive two free gifts just for visiting us. Just go to soundstrue.com backslash free gifts. That's soundstrue.com backslash free gifts. And now back to Insights at the Edge. You know, you mentioned, Adya, that with the Jesus story, you see in the story a map of awakening. And I'm curious how this experience for you with this intense physical pain and what you went through, how would you see that fitting on the map, if you will? Well, um, well, the, the part of the story that sort of, it, it's not necessarily that this sits on the map of the awakening as much as the image, one of the images really relates to it. You know, I think that image, um, this is, can be over-dramatizing it, but I think the image of Jesus on the cross is an iconic image of someone uh, experiencing um, something that's totally overwhelming. And even more than that, feeling completely abandoned. And so in that sense, you know, when I was experiencing that, um, like I said, uh, my realizations didn't save me from it. Uh, you know, if there had been a certain level of pain, physical pain, that, um, you know, you actually to be, you know, more conscious, it, it really helps you because you don't live in the pain as much. But all that kind of broke down, so it's like all of that abandoned me. And I, in a certain sense, I did feel totally abandoned. And when you're experiencing that, you know that somebody else who hasn't experienced it, no matter how much and how compassionate and how loving they are, you know that you're in it in a profound state of aloneness. If, I mean, I felt profoundly alone. Um, that people around me, I knew they didn't really they couldn't really grok or understand what I was experiencing in that moment. So there was a, that sense of aloneness that Jesus went through, of abandonment. Um, uh, I didn't necessarily feel abandoned by God because I didn't have Jesus' sort of relational um, aspect. You know, I didn't have God as something that I related to as other, so I didn't have that sense of abandonment. But... Um, I definitely had this, the feeling of a kind of abandonment and isolation and aloneness that I think is, is just is part of um, deep states of pain or deep states of suffering or sorrow or grief. They tend to make people feel very, very alone. And if they're very intense, it makes you feel abandoned because it makes you, in that aloneness, you feel like almost like no one, nothing can reach you there. You know? In my case, even drugs couldn't 
reach me. I had, I remember in the hospital one night, I was actually teaching in a retreat and I had a, an attack of this and I was taken in the middle of the night down the mountain to the hospital. And in the middle of the night, I'm in this hospital and there and I'm, you know, in this, in this terrible state of pain and they started giving me intravenous morphine, you know, and they gave me a shot of morphine and it didn't do anything. And 15 minutes later, they asked me how it was going. I said, I haven't noticed anything. They gave me another shot of morphine. A while later, they gave me a third shot of morphine. I didn't feel anything. After that, they gave me another shot of something else, Demerol or some other powerful pain medication. None of them, four shots, intravenous shots of very, very powerful pain medicine didn't touch it. Now, unfortunately for me, that wasn't because of the pain. That was because it's a genetic makeup. My mother, I found out, my mother also isn't affected by opiates. They don't actually help. They don't work for her. And they didn't work for me. So, I mean, I was even felt abandoned by all the sort of drugs or things that were, were you know, that you could be helped by, that could help lessen the pain. Nothing could lessen it for me. So, yeah, that real sense of abandonment and aloneness and was very much part of that experience. Now, let's say someone's listening. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who I think is going through a period like this, a period of despair and a sense of being abandoned and nothing will help. What can you say to someone in that state that might be helpful, do you think? That's a very good question. It's not an easy question to answer because having experienced it, there wasn't anything that someone told me that reached into what I was experiencing, do you know? Reach into it and really connected with it, even though I was had a lot of love and support during those moments. Um, like I said, for me, those moments came only when the pain came. I didn't live in fear between the episodes of pain. I didn't live in despair between the episodes of pain. That that part of the mind state didn't happen. Um, I think one of the one of the things that I've found because I have talked to people that have been experiencing that, um, I find that what they've told me is if they know someone who's gone through something that's made them f- feel like that. Uh, pe- in other words, people that I've talked to when I've described it that know that I've gone through an experience that in some way corresponds to what they're going through. I think it's very, very powerful uh, for our humanity to feel like someone comes up and says, I... I really do know. I've have actually been through this. I really do know. And my knowing that sort of brotherhood or sisterhood of, of my knowing is is it, that is the comfort. That is the that's the connection. And sometimes when people really know that you've been through something similar just knowing that someone else that you know or love or trust has been through it, you there's a way that um, it relieves the aloneness. It relieves the, the isolate some of the isolation, some of the you know abandonment. The I'm the only one feeling about it. Um, I think that's you know of course you can't give somebody that unless you've been through something that corresponds to it, but. Um, that's the first thing that comes up. Is that's, I think that's in many ways the most powerful, the most powerful thing, which is what people connect with in the Jesus story when they're going through something, even as a myth, they can connect with, okay, there was somebody who was pushed beyond the edge of their threshold. And they, you know, and I have, there's company. I have, I, I'm not completely alone in it. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, which I think can be very, very profound, um, just um, you know, real, real um, love and compassion. 
It's, it's, there's nothing special about it. I, I think that who we are is much more important than what we say. What we say is important, but it's informed by who we are. And if what we feel for someone is deeply loving, deeply compassionate, um, I think that that is, our, that is our greatest gift. We don't then have to be eloquent. We don't then have to have an, the, all the answers for them. Because um, in my case, there wasn't, there wasn't someone couldn't do something to take it away, you know? Um, I, like I said, I found out what was causing the problem myself. But, um, what did you discover, Aja? What was giving Actually, you, for me, you, what I discovered, yeah. I literally, after four years of this on and off, um, had every test in the, in the world, you know, wasn't allergic to anything almost. Um, so I never, you know, I mean, I tried to eat a good diet. But anyway, anyway when I totally, it hit me, okay, nobody can help me. Okay, nobody. I get it, nobody. And literally the next day that I completely and absolutely realized that nobody had my answers, I literally just had an intuition. And it was, Anya, just remove all the sugar, all the wheat, and all the dairy out of your diet. And my rational mind went, hmm, I wonder why. I don't test for being allergic or having a problem with any of those things. Of course, you know, I knew I ate too much sugar, but um, that's a whole, you know, that's, sure. I think most of us know that who are doing it. Um, but I just followed the intuition. I went, okay, I'll just, I just stopped, just right, right there, just like that. And um, within three days, the whole thing cleared up and never came back. So, you know, the solution was simple. Um, and I think this is this was a physical thing, but I think there is a correspondence to even things of deep emotional origin or existential origin within us um, that um, that sometimes when we really start to feel not, nothing outside of me has my answers. We can either resist that and go into even greater despair, or sometimes, like happened to me, something just goes, all right, that's the reality, that's the truth. Nobody has my answer. Okay, I better start listening to myself and see if it's going to come from somewhere. Just listen, 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 listen. See if it'll come. And I think very often the deepest difficulties that people face that I've seen, the really deep stuff, the stuff that just won't seem to go away with, you know, years of therapy or years of meditation or, you know, an, an, an endless self-help programs, all these things, and there's certain things that just don't seem to dislodge themselves. Sometimes when you get to that point and you go, nobody, I get it, nothing has my answer for me, nothing. There's something in you that stops reaching out. And as I said, you can boomerang into despair, which is just a which is a resistance to realizing nobody has your answer. Or you can just sort of be stopped there in that deep state of um unknowingness and just and just listen like you've never listened before. And so often, the things in people I find that are the most resistant to transformation require those kind of moments. Whether we get pushed to the edge to get to that moment or we just, you know, without going through awful suffering, we, we allow ourselves to see that, oh, I get it, nobody has my answer. Um, I guess it's up to me. Um, then sometimes and only then do we we gain access to a, a, an aspect, a region of our own being that we often don't have access to as long as there's even a la last little shred that said someone's going to have my answer for me. Sometimes people do have answers that can be really helpful, but in certain areas, you know, in that last little bit, let's go. There's a way that you gain access to a kind of listening that you couldn't get to before. 
when you're holding out hope that somebody else was going to have your answer to you, for you. So I think in that sense, whether it's physical, emotional, existent- by existential I mean of a deep spiritual nature, the existential issues of our life, who am I, what is God, what is life, what am I doing here, Do you know, um, that um, sort of being forced very deeply into us, these moments can force us very deeply into ourselves, which is part of the teaching of the mythic story of Jesus too. You know, why have you forsaken me, my God, my God? Why have you forsaken me? Or at the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, please, base, I'm paraphrasing, uh, take this cup from my lips. Please don't make, I see my destiny. I see what I'm going to have to go through. Please, please, anything but that, not that. And, you know, to the point of breaking down in tears in the garden three times and going back to his disciples and saying, can't you guys stay awake and support me? I need a little support, human support here. You know, help me out when I need it. And the, the moment is so intense that it literally drives them back into a state of unconsciousness, and he's left alone in the garden. Um, and so there he's pushed to his limit. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to have to do this. But then when he confesses that human feeling, that very, very human thing, when he's honest enough, sincere enough, and humble enough just to confess it, I don't want to have to do this. Please, please, please. When he allows himself to be human, that is what gains him access once again. It, he's realigned to sort of his own eternal nature when he goes, okay, um, thy will be done. At that moment, okay, take this cup from my lips, but if that's not your will, okay, thy will be done. That moment is a realigning with something, with his core. But I've always found he gained the realignment, he gained access to his eternal nature by being willing to fully experience his human nature. That, to me, is uh, what's very compelling about the story, is he wasn't running from his human nature, trying to meditate it away, hide in caves, you know, do everything he could so he could never have a human moment. He was right. It was almost as if he was chasing human moments, you know what I mean? That he was doing things in his life that were definitely not going to make life easy for him. Um, And I think there's a teaching in that, a complete willingness to embrace your humanity is one of the quickest ways to reconnect with your divinity. Very paradoxical. One of the themes that you talk about in the book, Resurrecting Jesus, is this idea of redemption, that we can pour ourselves into human life as a means of redemption. And I wonder if you can speak about that, especially what that word means to you, redemption. Yeah, um... I've used that, you know, I've used that word uh, a fair amount, and understandably, um, you know, it causes um, some confusion, um, you know, for people because there are so many, you know, ideas about redemption and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the way I use the word redemption, what redemption means to me, to, and I actually, there's many different definitions of of redemption. One of them that corresponds to what I'm talking about is simply to restore something to its state of honor and worth. To restore something to its natural state of worth. That is to redeem something. And um, the notion of redemption, I find, is really uh, resonant within uh, the Western human psyche especially because part of our tradition is um, that our very existence is flawed. Origin- the idea is original is sin, you know, and that sort of notion of original sin um, was predated both Christianity and Judaism, um, but they really brought it into the, the Western vernacular in a powerful way. Um, but that is part of our heritage, 2,000 years of that of the belief that your very existence, somehow there's, it's, it's, it's stained. There's something wrong with you. 
Um, if that's part of what you grow up with, which is that is the, the number one disease of the Western psyche is a feeling of unworthiness. Um, and no wonder, because the myth that has formed Western, the Western psyche for well over 2,000 years has been a myth of unworthiness. You're so unworthy that God has to basically be reincarnate, has to incarnate himself as a son and be killed in order to, you know, uh, get, pay the ransom for how awful we are. Now, that's a really heavy, dark theology to embody. And even if we, whether we accept that or we reject that, it's still part of the collective consciousness in a very powerful way. And so, in the East, you know, someone may go through difficulties, but they have sort of the notion of compassion. You know, just be loving, be compassionate, and that helps heal a kind of psychic wound in their mind. In the West, that psychic wound often cuts much deeper. It cuts much more to the core because, you know, in the East, they don't have, in Asia and stuff, they don't have the the idea that you're born, your, your birth is sort of symbolic of an essential flaw. That's not part of their tradition. But here, that is part of our tradition. Um, and because that's part of our tradition, it calls, calls for a deeper kind of healing. Just to be compassionate doesn't touch the deepest, that kind of deep wound that's in most people here in the West that I find. Um, so the kind, when I think of redemption, I think of redemption is actually a kind of particular quality of love. It is the experience of a particular kind of love that when we experience it, it makes us feel almost immediately whole, healed, as if everything is suddenly completely forgiven. Just upon touching, experiencing the redemptive quality of love. And so, of course, that got that experience got personified into the story of Jesus. Jesus becomes the human manifestation of that experience. God so loved the world that he gave it his only begotten son. That is the attitude. That's a theology, but that theology comes from an experience, an attitude of the redemptive quality of love that gives itself to sorrow doesn't just hold up in its blissful heavenly state of love, but gives itself to sorrow, touches sorrow, and through that love giving itself, sacrificing itself in a certain way, as soon as it touches sorrow, it immediately feels healed, as if, as if nothing ever needed to be healed. It may be forgiven to such an extent that it feels as if nothing ever needed to be forgiven, and that's that is to restore us to our to our uh, natural state of worth. Not that I don't think that we are actually essentially flawed in in our in our the deepest part of our existence. Um, we are obviously you know most most human beings are born or or get confused in their life and, and have great suffering based on that, but. Um, that quality of redemptive love when we open to it is very, very, very powerful. It can heal that wound right up and it can heal it almost instantly when someone really, really opens to it. And it's part of the, one of the gifts of, I think of the transmission, the energy field of the Jesus story is, is it, has that, it has the gift of, of that redemptive quality of love. What do you mean when you talk about pouring oneself fully into the world or pouring love fully? What do you mean by that? Well, um, first of all, I come at it from an absolutely experiential basis. My experience of when this occurred to me 
was I literally felt a experienced a um, it was as if liquid liquid love was literally poured right down through the top of my head. It literally felt like it was just being poured into me, right down into the top of my head. It sort of pooled in the in the chest, in the in the heart. And it just sort of started then to radiate out from the heart. So not only did I experience it coming in and the great sort of healing and and uh, um, uh, redemption of it, but also when it started to radiate out from the heart, then I not only experienced it, but I could see the world through its eyes, through the eyes of that kind of, redemptive quality of love and when you see the world through those eyes you see everything as as whole and 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 of extraordinary worth and extraordinary that everything and every being actually has uh, an unimaginable degree of dignity in the depth of their being so when i use the you know the the, the poured itself um, that comes from a very literal sort of experience. Curiously enough, it's one of the things that resonated with me right at the beginning of the Jesus story when he goes to the River Jordan and uh, he's baptized by John the Baptist and the the heavens split open and the Spirit descends upon him like a dove, as it says, a beautiful image. The Spirit descends upon him, which is a completely different image than we get in a lot of yogic systems where you know, you literally wake up and out of the body. And I've had that experience too. You literally wake up and out. Something literally leaves, leaves the body in a certain sense, experientially. That's a particular kind of awakening. This, right at the beginning of this story, is signifying this is something very different. This is not about up and out. This is about down and in. The spirit didn't leap from from within him up and out and free itself of form, the spirit poured itself into him, into form. And that corresponded very much to that experience of uh, having this kind of redemptive quality of love um, pour itself into my incarnate, you know, um, existence and then doing so transformed my vision, my perception. Then I could see that this this was actually also uh, within existence. In a certain sense, this actually was the essence of existence. So, Audrey, when this liquid love was poured down into the top of your head, what was happening? I mean, were you meditating? Were you out in the woods? What was going on? No, it was uh, well. In a certain sense, yes, it was actually in the midst of at the. Um, it was sort of the conclusion of a terrible experience, actually, that I. Um, I had this very profound awakening at 25, and very very transformative, and I won't go into that in detail at the moment. But, um, uh, and you know, I had been going to these retreats for about five years before that happened, and big thing happened and um and and I to be honest I hated going to retreats I always loved the idea of going to a retreat but as soon as I got there I just hated it I felt like a caged animal the entire time I was at retreat somehow I knew that I was supposed to be there and that this was actually really good for me and when I wasn't at retreat, I would always often find out why it was good for me because that's when I would get my realizations. That's when I would realize what actually was occurring deep within me during those retreats that I didn't necessarily feel at the moment. Anyway, I really didn't like going to retreats. So when I had this experience, great opening, I felt full of confidence. I had no fear whatsoever. All fear was taken out of my system. And I had no fear, and I just looked so forward. I thought, now I can go to a retreat, and I'm not, you know, no fear. I have no anticipation of this will be fantastic. This will be great. This will be, you know, all that stuff. So about a year after I had that experience, I ended up on this retreat, and full of confidence, you know, really happy to be there, and it was a disaster. I just 
I felt like such a caged animal once again. My great experience, my great revelatory moment um, left me. It, I mean, what I realized didn't leave me, but it didn't save me from this tremendous sense of being, again, like a caged animal. It's hard to describe. The, it wasn't that I had fear. It's that I had literally just adrenaline pumping through my system day and night. And um, after about the third day, I cracked. I literally couldn't stay. And I, they told us all to, uh, if you're going to leave retreat or something, you know, tell, 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 tell the teacher, tell somebody, don't just leave. But I was so absolutely humiliated, embarrassed by having to leave, devastated, that I wrote this note and I waited until everyone went into the meditation hall and I literally pinned it on the door of the teacher. I was so I just couldn't face anybody, and I just and I got in my car and I drove away and I really I mean everything in me felt this is it, uh, you know I had this great experience and I've been at this and I really tried hard and look where I am I'm slinking out of a retreat and I just felt this is it I'm done um, my quest I guess has failed and I was just ready to move on I just I guess I'm not cut out for that so it was. Sort of, you know, it's quite devastating in a way. Anyway, I pull, I, I pull up to the house, drive two hours home, pull up to the house, and I'm in such a sort of a wrung out experience. You know, I'm just completely wrung out, tired, and I've gone through this terrible experience, and I'm just wrung out. I don't have any resistance left in me. And I pull up in the driveway, and this little voice in my set, head says, just go straight through the house, go into the back road, and go into your meditation hut. And my rational mind says, why am I doing that? I've just given up on this. This is it. I'm done. I'm, I've failed. I have forget it. I can never, this will never come to anything. But I had no resistance. And so I just literally walked back there almost like a zombie, you know. Um, I just had no resistance. I walked down. I sat down in my meditation hut. And I didn't even really start meditating. You know, I didn't really start. I just sat down. And I was just sitting there. And I was just sitting in that feeling of, this is it. This, it's over. You know, I failed. And right in the middle of that moment, this that's when it all happened. This extraordinary um, benevolence just literally poured right into the top of my head and just just filled me up in a in a extraordinary way. It just came out of nowhere. It just just right in that moment of humiliating defeat, uh, it just started to pour into me, and it totally filled me up. And I'm sitting there, it totally transformed, of course, the way I saw everything. And and I didn't have a sense of okay, now I'm back on the path. I can do this. None of that. Not, like that wasn't even a concern. It was just I was just so filled with this sense of benevolence and and love and compassion. And strangely enough, I literally heard a voice. And I'm not a big voice vision kind of guy. But I heard this voice and it said, literally, this is how I love you. And this is how you shall love all things and all beings. So at that instant, I realized this, whatever this is that's happening, this isn't given to me just for me. That I am to, this is how I am supposed to see life. This is how I am to live life. It was sort of a directive. It was almost like a commandment. And uh, anyway, that, you know, I experienced that very, very profound um, opening of the heart, really. Um, Got a call from the teacher that night. The teacher says, what happened? And I said, I don't know. I, you know, I didn't know. I said, I don't know. And the teacher said, why don't you come back tomorrow? And I said, okay. And we hung up the phone. That was the conversation. I end the, the next day I get in the car. I drive two hours back up to where the retreat site was, to the temple. I walk towards the meditation hall. Everybody's gone in. I'm the last one to go in. The senior sort of disciplinarian person that's running the retreat is standing, this old, his old, oldest student, one of his old students, and he looks at me as I'm just about to walk in the door of the meditation hall, and he looks at me very sternly and says, you shouldn't have left, and you shouldn't have come back. And when he said that to me, I was just filled with this joy, and I just wanted to reach out and hug him. 
And because what I realized that what he said highlighted for me that this that I was that I had experienced this benevolent love that it couldn't be moved by what anybody said the judgment of anybody. Uh, he was right, by the way. I wasn't supposed to leave. And as far as he knew, I just showed up. I just came back out of nowhere. You know, he probably didn't know that I talked to the teacher or anything. So from his point of view, it was all very rational. Um, but, you know, it's something that could ob- easily have devastated me, you know. You shouldn't have left. You shouldn't have come back. You could slink back out in your, you know, in your devastation. But actually, it highlighted this love and this benevolence, and I felt so grateful. In fact, this day, even every time I tell the story, I feel such, such great gratitude for him for saying just those words because it's, it's like he, he helped set that experience into my system. It literally kind of helped it take root because it provided this contrast that I saw, wow, nothing... Nothing can move this, and I can even say what he's saying to me as loving. And I see it to this day. It was actually, that's how I see it. So that's, that's a long explanation, but that's how, that's how my experience of this sort of redeeming, redemption, redemptive love uh, came in. And the words you heard were, this is how I love you, and this is how... You will love the world? This is how you shall love all things and all beings. And that, that, also, that became part of my practice. Not in a, in a phony way, not to try to love people or things that I didn't, but what does it, you know, it was really a way of saying, see the world through these eyes. This, this, like, like I said, I knew this isn't given to you just so you sit around and feel great. That's wonderful. You're healed. You've, it's had a transforming effect. Okay, but this is also for you to, to express this, to embody this, to whatever extent you can. This is a gift that's given so that you give it away, not just so you hoard it for yourself. And I think that that was a very, very important thing for me to recognize at that moment. And, Aji, I think a beautiful way to end our conversation about the new book on resurrecting Jesus, embodying the spirit of a revolutionary mystic. And, you know, I was going to ask you this question, which is, how do you listen? Because I always find talking with you, whether it's an interview or whether we're just talking as friends, I always find this incredible quality that you have of listening. But you answered the question in the story of the liquid love so thank you. You're welcome. It's really been delightful to be with you as always, Tim. With Sounds True, Adya Shanti has released a new book as well as an audio series, and there's a video teaching series as well on resurrecting Jesus, embodying the spirit of a revolutionary mystic. Also with Sounds True, Adya has released a book and audio series called Falling into Grace, insights on the end of suffering and one of my favorite book and audio series check out this title it's called the end of your world uncensored straight talk on the nature of enlightenment thanks adya and thanks everyone for listening i'd also like to thank our sponsor spirituality and health magazine soundstrue.com many voices one journey thanks for listening